We also talked to the majority leader about USMCA. He penned an op-ed pushing the Democrats to go ahead and, and get that approved and, and passed into, in, into law. Uh, how big of an impact would it have if that particular trade agreement uh, went through Lizanne as far as the markets are concerned? Um, probably more of a psychological impact than a direct impact. What is amazing to me is that as I, I travel every week, I'm on the road talking to our investors, and a lot of the people who are more on the hardline side of, of trade and think we're doing the right thing with regard to tariffs have often said to me, well, we're beholden because we already passed NAFTA or USMCA. And when I <clears> mentioned <throat> that it's actually not yet ratified, there's a lot of people that don't realize that. So I think there's been this perception that we've already dealt with some of these trade deals, and that gives us a better bargaining position uh, with, with China. And so I think the reality of something like that getting passed, I think, might give a little psychological boost that maybe we're kind of back in the driver's seat. And Brian, taking a look at the uh, markets overall, the S&P, we're really close to where we were exactly a year ago, with, within a couple of percentage points. You think that perhaps the markets are too, investors have been too pessimistic? Where do you see things going uh, for the quarter to close the year? Well, I think uh, on a near-term basis, uh, investors remain very fearful. I think most institutional investors who are primary client really missed the recovery in September because they were too negatively positioned in August and they have memories of what happened in the fourth quarter last year and so from our lens and, and based on the conversations that we're having when we meet with our clients to talk with our clients most of our institutional clients are sitting on uh, their hands with respect to the USMCA we think it's a positive uh, yes Lizanne's correct uh, with respect to psychological but from a fundamental perspective too I think it strengthens North America overall and I think people need to understand that Mexico is the second largest deficit in terms of trading deficit with the United States, and it opens up an opportunity uh, to make that even stronger. But remember, too, Canada, where I am today, is the uh, U.S.'s number one trade partner. And from a North American fundamental perspective, we actually think this could be very positive for North American stocks, especially Canadian and U.S. stocks overall, as asset flows continue to come back to the United States and Canada in particular, especially considering uh, the, the momentum and volatility uh, on a negative basis with respect to both emerging markets and Europe. Lizanne, what's your ex expectation for the fourth quarter? I mean, we think back to what that was looking like in Q4 of 2018. This year we have tariffs on more goods coming in from China right now. Plus we have even more tumult and, and potentially risky headlines and activities coming out of D.C. Uh, do you expect that we could have another volatile end to the year? I, I think it's possible. Obviously, we've got the proposed additional rounds of tariffs going in both mid-October and mid-December, so a lot of it is a function of what happen, happens with those. And I think as we get into third quarter reporting season, what we're seeing, and I think what has contributed to the volatility certainly in, in August and even back in May, has been a lot, of, lot more meat put on the bones by companies of what the, the trade war and tariffs impact is on their own bottom lines, whether they're eating at profit margins, whether they're passing it on to the consumer. Consumer confidence weakness... Uh, uh, in the past month was to some degree tied to trade. So even consumers are starting to reflect that. So I think not only reports for the third quarter, the, the conference calls around them, but uh, forecasting on the part of companies uh, and establishing, I, I'd say, a kind of a, a, an opportunity for analysts to look into 2020 from an earnings perspective, because a lot of analysts I talk to, even though I don't look at individual companies, um, say they haven't done much with 2020 earnings because of that ongoing trade uncertainty, especially with regard to the next two tranches in mid-October and mid-December. So if you could kind of lay out that scenario, I think it'd be clearer to judge what the fourth quarter is going to look like. Yeah. I mean, Brian, if we're looking for landmines for Q4, um, we can look at trade and we can look at the consumer. But some have suggested this morning that it might be wild cards like whether or not IPOs can continue or why the repo rate remains at least today muted uh, elevated but muted. I mean, what, what, you think there's a, a chance it could come out of left field? Yeah, there's always that canary in the coal mine that you have to worry about. I think it could be that maybe rates start to head a little bit higher and most people are not uh, positioned accordingly for that. And that's why, you know, we continue to like uh, financials and money center banks in particular because we think uh, most people are, are under invested there. We do think there could be some more geopolitical risk and, and fundamental weakness out of Europe and emerging markets that most people aren't accounting for. Remember, all you're hearing the last couple of weeks is that everyone's getting bullish now 
on Europe, again, based on valuation. We don't buy or sell stocks on valuation. We buy them due to, to fundamental reasons. I just think that the tariff situation in the fourth quarter could add some volatility. Uh, but I do think it's going to be uh, one of those periods where we want to be stock pickers and not asset allocators. And we want to we be able to be in a position to add to our favorite stocks on weakness and hold those stocks longer term in a lower turnover portfolio. And Lizanne, I know you're, you don't watch uh, individual stocks, but I was looking back through tech uh, over the last quarter. And as a sector, semiconductors really seem to have had a great quarter. I mean, Applied, Micron, TI, Seagate, LAM Research, Western Digital, all more than 10% higher, though they've had a rough week. I wonder how you think the particular choppiness, the type that we've been seeing, trade-related, might have an impact on a sector like that that has tended to be pretty responsible, uh, responsive to headlines uh, over the past year. Yeah, we, we actually took uh, tech from a multi-year overweight about a year ago down to uh, market perform. So that's just really a neutral position. At that point, it was mostly a function of valuation of some of the kind of high-flying names, some of the, the risk associated with, with FANG, and some of the concerns we had heading into the fourth quarter of last year broadly for the market. Now I think factors um, are becoming increasingly important. And I think sort of looking ahead at the stability of earnings growth beyond, say, the next quarter, that kind of time horizon, relatively low volatility, that, that outlook into earnings that is fairly stable, I think supports some of those, not necessarily pure cyclical areas, but areas where you can see growth even in a relatively slow economic environment. I think you're probably going to find them in subsets of technology, no question.